Welcome to the Compassion Film Fest and another live, live stream webinar. We are so grateful that you are here and taking part, engaging in this really important aspect of being compassionate in our own lives. I wanted to introduce Dan Paquette. Dan is part of the team here who will be helping to take your questions and get them over to our speaker, John. So thank you, Dan, for being here, for being so kind to offer your kindness, your help. And I wanted to introduce John Bruna. John is a author, counselor, teacher, both of mindfulness and of Dharma. He is the author of The Wisdom of a Meaningful Life, The Essence of Mindfulness, also the uh, essential guidebook to mindfulness and recovery. And you are in for a treat as John takes this hour to share with you some wisdom of compassion. Thanks, John. And we are looking forward to this time. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and such a joy to be with all of you today. I hope you all are enjoying the Compassion Festival and you're accessing these incredible films, feeling inspired as we celebrate the power of compassion and compassion in action. And so that's a bit about what we will talk about today. The title of our talk today is The Wisdom of Compassion. This is just to me, uh, really core to my adult experience. I grew up with a lot of mental and emotional struggles. I grew up uh, with uh, a lot of drugs and violence and some poverty. And I um, developed some skills to try to mitigate that and uh, to not suffer. And so it's been this quest of how do I not suffer? How do I survive? And, you know, how do I find a way of being okay? And so this has been a, a bit of a lifelong journey for me. And fortunately, the last uh, 36 years have been very productive in that quest. But along that way, I've had this opportunity to you know, live a multitude of experiences, everything from being homeless, living under a bridge, to uh, being a corporate manager, a school teacher, a Buddhist monk, and a counselor, uh, a single dad, uh, currently a grandparent, and an auto mechanic, and so forth. So a lot of different life experiences. And throughout them, the central theme was, you know, how can I be okay? How can I not suffer? If we think about this in our lives, isn't that just a predominant motivation to not suffer, right? We don't wake up and, and think, you know, how do I suffer? We, we wake up generally thinking about what can I do that will make me feel good and what can I not do uh, that would create suffering? Or even more proactively, what can I do that would eliminate suffering? And therein lies this wisdom of compassion, the actions that I take, the ways of being in the world that remove or reduce suffering in our lives. And so this wisdom of compassion is something that we've all been developing for a long time. And we don't always stick that label on, but I want us to think about what this journey of compassion is, what this wisdom is that we, we have, that we've been developing, that we can increase and what are some new skills that we might be able to incorporate? So I'm going to, uh, just before I get too into this, let everyone know that if you have a question, if you have a comment or anything, there's a, a little comment section there and feel free to type them in. Dan will uh, get those questions to me at any time during the talk. So if you have anything pop up, happy to try to respond to that as quickly as possible. So what is this thing that we call compassion? Let's see if I can effectively uh, bring up my slides here. 
Oops, went uh, one too far. So this is one of the main keys that I think people get confused with is compassion is actually the desire to remove or reduce suffering. So people will share some things like compassion fatigue or what about if I'm compassionate all the time, I'm going to suffer a lot. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to feel miserable a lot and take on the world's problems. And so there's some misperceptions around compassion. I'd just like to, to get to right at the beginning here. When we're talking about compassion, we're talking specifically about this, this definition, the desire to remove or reduce suffering. All right, so I'm suffering. I don't want to suffer. I see someone suffering. I don't want them to suffer. That desire, that impulse, that motivation, that drive. And if you start to think about it, even you know, right now, you can notice that there's an energy to it, right? There's an energy to it. Uh, compassion is, you know, is, a, is an energy and it's uh, something that is not going to drain us. It's something that can actually uh, fuel us and inspire us and get us into action. So when we think about compassion in the sense of, you know, I don't want to suffer and I want to reduce suffering, we can just pause right now and think about the multitude of ways that you are compassionate in your own life. How many things do you, did you do today to reduce suffering? And that could be everything from, uh, you know, kicking your shoes off with your feet being sore. It could be uh, eating healthier today so that you wouldn't suffer later in terms of your body. Uh, it could be, you know, just very simple activities that we've engaged in throughout the day and we weren't even thinking of it as compassion, right? There are a lot of skills that we have learned in our life uh, from lessons learned. <laughs> you know, the old straightforward analogy is putting a hand in a fire, right? It burns, I don't do that anymore. So there's a lot of life lessons that we've had that, uh, that we now put into place so that we don't fall into some mistakes that create suffering in our lives. So there's already a wealth of some wisdom, but some of that wisdom doesn't work so well today, as we'll find out. Some of the lessons of our past, some of the things that we do to avoid suffering might actually, in the long term, create a little more suffering. And so this is where the wisdom that we cultivate in our life has to be an ongoing experience. Right, I've learned a lot of lessons in my past about how to survive and do some, some things in a very difficult environment that are not very healthy for me to do today, but they served a purpose at that time. And as we grow and as we engage in the world, we might have some coping mechanisms. It could be from traumatic events that we've experienced, uh, adverse childhood experiences, uh, things that we've had in, in relationships. And so we've created different ways of interacting with others and maybe some barriers that we put up or some other coping mechanisms, some ways of um, trying to deal with some mental and emotional pain that may have served a purpose at one point, but don't serve us very well anymore. It actually can prevent us from fully embracing our life and eliminating a lot more suffering. So there's a, quite a bit here when we think about this journey of compassion and I talked <clears throat> excuse me talked about 36 years of my own of this conscious process but it's a journey and it's something that invites the question all the time what would be the most beneficial thing to do here what would be helpful what would be beneficial so it's very important if we want to reduce suffering in our life is to know you know what that suffering is it's very important to understand the role that compassion plays and to be very clear about a couple things so one is this idea of empathy right uh, when we people talk about compassion fatigue you know this thing that can drain you and burn out well actually what they're talking about is empathy fatigue and it, so compassion is this energy this desire to remove suffering empathy 
which is critical to have, right? We need empathy. Empathy is the capacity to understand or feel what another person's experiencing. Oops. I guess that's on a timer. So I wonder how well that will work. Huh. I think I got an idea. I'm just going to do this if you don't mind. It's not pretty, but it won't click. So with empathy, we have this opportunity to experience what another's feeling from within their frame of reference the best that we can. And even put ourselves in, in their position. Now that's very different than uh, compassion. And with empathy, I can experience the suffering. I can feel that suffering. Uh, I can relate to that suffering. And so that's going to create some stress in my body if they're suffering. Now, if they're feeling good, I can have empathy and feel pretty good about it. So empathy has these other roles, right? My joy at seeing uh, someone do something well. And, you know, these heartwarming things that we get to see. I got to see a little girl who was singing to a little horse and petting. A horse, you know, it's a very joyful experience that we can also experience. So empathy has this wide range. It's relating to and experience the feelings of another, kind of putting ourselves in their shoes. So that could lead to burnout, stress, and being overwhelmed, right? If I'm taking on the feelings of everyone else, if I'm taking on, right now we're in a pandemic, you know, a sense of hopelessness and, uh, you know, if you see the news and see people suffering, we can be pretty overwhelmed by that. And so empathy in that sense uh, can lead to despair, distress, burnout, being overwhelmed, hopeless. And that's where we really need to, when we have these feelings arise, where we relate to and experience suffering of others, is to have compassion arise. Compassion affects a completely different part of the brain system more related to the reward system and it's an energy and it's you know i want to do something about this i'm inspired to do something about this and so its quest is to reduce or remove the suffering and so this role of compassion is asking that bigger question how do i reduce how do i remove suffering Now, we don't always have the ability to do that, right? So then the, the question is, you know, what is it that would be the healthiest thing to do in this moment? And so sometimes when I think of, uh, you know, what can I do to, to help, you know, this big world that we live in? I'm, I'm just one person. Well, you can always bring your compassion into your interactions. And the moment you do, there's more compassion in the world. I can give some of my attention. Mother Trace has a great line, don't worry about numbers, start with the one in front of you. And what we can always do is our best in any given situation. And so if we start to understand this context of compassion, we're going to pack that a little further with wisdom to know that I... I'm just one, but, but my one matters and I'm interconnected with this incredible realm of others in the world that we live in, that my interactions of kindness, of acceptance, of care and compassion have ripples and they affect others uh, beyond anything that we can really understand. Even, you know, picking up a, maybe a broken bottle from a bike trail and what did you prevent, you know, someone from falling or a child getting hurt or so forth? Something that we shared to another human being. I used to be a school teacher. I've had many students come back from years later and say, well, this one thing you said, you know, led me to this in my life. Uh, so think about how many times in your life you've helped someone, you've done a kind thing. And we have no idea where those ripples go. How many people have offered you a bit of advice or been there when you were struggling and how much that meant to you. Uh, there's an incredible world of recovery of people that don't use substances anymore due to their addiction. And how many families has that affected and how many parents have been reunited with children and how many people are safer on the roads now 
still be people are safe around people that are safe. People are safe around you. What we do matters. How we interact in the world matters. If we really want to change the world, it starts with changing how we interact with others. John Francis, an incredible, uh, you can look up a TED talk by him, uh, but his whole point to changing the environment was, you know, we need to change how we interact with each other. So never underestimate the power of being a good example. That has ripples beyond anything we can measure. And the thing is, it all takes time. And part of the wisdom of compassion is an incredible, deep understanding of the nature of our experience and acceptance of our role in that. So we'll get to that in just a bit here. The, uh, let's see if I can get back to my little screen here and uh, just skip here. So think about these sources of suffering. Now, if I don't want to suffer, it's going to be really important to know what that suffering is all about. Where does it come from? Right? And our misperception is that my suffering is coming from my circumstance. It's coming from that person, you know. And I would be so much happier if only. But in fact, the majority of our mental and emotional suffering doesn't come from the events, circumstances, or people in our lives. They arise from how we perceive experience and relate to them. So what's that mean? Have you noticed that uh, we can have a pretty difficult event happen? It could be a car accident. And it could just ruin our day or uh, or we could have shifted and, and went into solution mode and you know made sure everybody was okay and we might have had a whole different experience thinking we weren't injured, nobody was injured, you know, uh, or how incredibly scary that was and how wrong this person is for you know having sped or whatever our situation is that a car accident based on how we perceive that event, how we experience it personally, whether we've had other you know, car wrecks and, and what might have been triggered there. Well, how we experience this is going to create a lot of this mental and emotional suffering. And so even a very simple analogy is, you know, if you see your car hit out in the parking lot, like, you know, there's a car in a parking lot just backs out and slams into a car. Now, if it's not your car, you're probably not going to suffer much, right? But then you find out it's your car. <laughs> so now I'm suffering. And so, you know, this event, there's my car, and then I want my car to be a certain way. That's a whole different level of suffering. Well, what's the difference? That's mental and emotional. It's my attachment to my car and how I want my, my things to be. And some relationship to my happiness of my car not be uh, damaged or, you know, any financial concern there. And all of that is in my mind. I'm okay. My car's over, over there. I'm not injured. Uh, hopefully I have insurance. Maybe I don't. But watching somebody else's car, watching my car, the difference mine, suddenly there's a whole different mental and emotional state involved here. And the misperception is that I would be happy if my, my car wasn't injured, right, damaged. Right? That's an interesting misperception because all of us, you know, I think most of us maybe here might have a car, right? And it's probably, maybe it's okay right now. Are you still subject to not being happy, having anxiety, having stress, worry, or fear? even though your car is okay. And have you ever had a car that was damaged and been, you know, been okay? Been able to be happy? So this is really critical to understand with compassion 
in the sense of understanding what the source of our suffering is. Now, sometimes there's some physical and, and other types of suffering. It's very natural. It's part of life. And uh, you hit me, you know, with a baseball bat. It's going to hurt, going to suffer. I can think all the happy thoughts in the world. Probably not going to help so much. So what we're talking about here is, in addition to normal human suffering, which is pretty natural, right? We're uh, part of being human. We're going to get sick, right? We're going to be ill. We're going to have uh, challenges in our relationships. People are going to die in our lives. I mean, we're going to have a natural process of uh, mental and emotional hardships. So the point here with wisdom is we don't need to increase those, okay? And one of the biggest sources of suffering is to think I shouldn't suffer. One of the biggest sources of suffering is a thought that says I shouldn't suffer. And that's something to investigate. How often do we carry that thought? I shouldn't suffer. Now, I, I totally understand that everybody else has got their, their things. You know, we've got therapists and counselors. We have hospitals. We have uh, clinical uh, therapeutic settings for people for a wide range of mental and emotional sufferings. We have auto repair shops for cars. We have first responders. Uh, you know, people get injured all the time. People die. I mean, I see that in everybody, but... For some reason in my mind, I can think that, well, I shouldn't have those problems. And so there's an incredible amount of suffering that arises simply from the idea that I should not suffer. My family should love me. You know, my relationship should be, you know, a particular way. My car shouldn't break down. My job shouldn't change. And with that perception, with that mindset, well, you can see how that's ripe with suffering because all those things are going to happen, right? <laughs> and I see it as evidence in everybody else's life. I've experienced it in my own life, but my mind can still go, hey, we can avoid this. And there's a very big difference between proactively taking steps to avoid suffering and an inherent belief that I shouldn't suffer. Scott Peck, his book, The Road Less Traveled, this great truth was that life is difficult. But once we understand it's difficult, once we accept that, we transcend it. It's no longer very difficult. Once I recognize that life's messy for everyone, including me, boy, I'm going to have a whole different tool bag to deal with life because I'm not thinking it should be different. I'm no longer a victim. I'm an active participant in this messy thing we call life where there's lots of ups and downs. There's lots of sufferings that arise. There's lots of joys that I can embrace. And I can't capture all my joy and make my world this one way. And I can't avoid just all the suffering that may arise uh, these are interdependent things of having joy, experiencing them, having that come and go, having my life change, having people in my life come and go, having jobs change. This is life. I get older. I do not have the same body I used to. <laughs> I, uh, I recognize that frequently. So a lot of things I can't do anymore. But if I think I should, I'm going to suffer a lot. So this is you know, just a critical piece in the wisdom of compassion is one of the most compassionate things I can do is start to live in reality. And I think I have that on my next slide here. So these are our two working hypotheses. If we want happiness, we want to avoid suffering. The very first one is the more you live in reality, the less mental and emotional suffering you'll have. That's supposed to say suffering. Uh, typo. So the more you live in reality, the less mental and emotional suffering you will have. So I like to put this as a working hypothesis because I think people should check these things out. Are they true or not true? 
not true just because we've had some research or some data or so and so said it or I read it here. Uh, but let me investigate this. Is this true or not? So if I start living more in reality, accepting life on life's terms in the way things actually are, will I have less mental and emotional suffering? So what would that be? So how much of our mental and emotional suffering is based on something that's not true? Like I shouldn't suffer, for example. <laughs> Or that my partner should, you know, be a certain way, or that my job should change. How much of our suffering has to directly relate to I want things to be different than they are? I'm just gonna let you pause for that one for a minute. How much of your suffering is directly related? to I don't want things to be the way they are. Let's take it a step further. I don't think things should be this way. That should not have happened. How many times that that should not have happened? Well, there's a whole lot of suffering in that one. So if we, is that true? That should not have happened. Well, first off, am I the, you know, all knowing divine center of the universe that knows what should and should happen and how the road crews on the highway should be operating and how clerks at the grocery stores should do things or how the United Nations should run? I mean, am I that person that, you know, knows how all this stuff should be? Or are there over 7 billion other humans and a lot of other causes and conditions in the natural environment that is shaping the world that we all live in? And am I focused on what I think should happen or how I would like things to happen based on my view of my you know, 57 years in this world and my you know, vast knowledge <laughs> of the inner workings and interdependency of, of all the cultures that live in this world of what should and shouldn't happen. Or do I have a preference? And then this idea that that should or shouldn't have happened, well, let's investigate that. Was there a cause for it to happen? Does anything happen without a cause? And I think if we investigate that, there's going to be a cause that led to a result and it something happened. I may not like the cause, like this person wasn't paying attention and hit my car, but there was a car. It's not that it shouldn't have happened. It did happen, and it happened for a variety of reasons. I parked my car there, someone was driving somewhere, maybe they're distracted, uh, maybe they're on a call, who knows? And, but there was a cause, another car, another person, and it hit my car. And that's, there's a cause. Who's to say it shouldn't have happened? Now, I could not like that it happened, and there's no, no big problem with that. There's a big distinction in that should not have happened. There's an incredible amount. We can suffer naturally with having to deal with the car getting hit, understanding that I didn't like it, but it did happen. And the quicker I can get to that point, the less suffering I'll have, period. It's already happened. Okay, now, everything else in my mind about how it shouldn't have happened or how unfair it happened, or whatever goes on, every story from that point is suffering that is unnecessary because all of that's in my mind. How much time do we spend there? Car's hit. Okay, what do we do about it? So that's just one of a myriad of ways of uh, types of things that we don't do very well generally as humans in terms of living realities, thinking how things shouldn't. And then the idea of if only, right? If only I would have gone, you know, the one I like to use all the time is if only I would have gone 
to college and gotten that other degree and I would have had this other career and my life would be so wonderful. Or if only I would have taken that vacation in Hawaii, you know, and what my life would be like, then I could be happy. So there's an interesting thing when we start with if only, especially anything to do with the past, is everything that happens after if only is not true, right? It doesn't exist anywhere. It never happened. And it only exists in my mind. And it exists in my mind telling me that if this would have happened, I would have had this career, and my life would have been like this, and I'd make X amount of money. Well, first off, none of those things happened, so I have no idea how things would have turned out. I don't know if I'd have gone to that college, I would have gotten sick and died. I don't know if I'd have gone to that college, my roommate would be a serial killer. I, you know, None of those stories pop up in my head. What pops up in my head is a whole story around how wonderful my life would have been if only I had done that, or if I would have, you know, had that relationship, or if I'd have gone off on, you know, uh, this vacation, how much fun I would have had, and yet I never went. I have no idea, and I don't know if I'd have been robbed. I don't know if I'd have lost something. I don't know if I'd have got sick. Nothing happened. So, all of this mental and emotional suffering around if only exists nowhere but that night. And yet it can seem so compelling and so true. I'm gonna come back here so that in case people do have questions that pop in. So the more I live in reality, which is here right now, for example, Okay, right now I live in this moment. If I'm here in this moment, not how things should have been or if all these, uh, what is my current moment? Am I okay? Am I physically healthy and well? Here I am talking with all of you. Compassion, that's feeling pretty good about that. A little congested, you may hear that. But I'm not pretty good. I'm well fed. I can walk. I'm not in any physical pain. Uh, right now, there's really nothing to fix. I don't have any issues. I don't have a, a big problem. But if someone were to ask me what my issues are and what I need to work on, well, I might come up with a list. <laughs> okay, they weren't here in this moment. This moment, there's nothing broken, nothing to fix. But I could start, you know, bringing my mind to, you know, what I would like to improve, what I need to work on. Here's these issues I've been working on for years. And again, this is going to have to do with my mental and emotional state based on what I'm paying attention to. So what am I paying attention to? The other incredible way that we create suffering in our life is, uh, you know, if you ever done this, this statement of, I always make that mistake. Ah, oh, there I am again. I always make that mistake. Well, that's investigating. Is that true? Do you always make that mistake? Like, what about the rest of your life when you're not making that mistake? Which, yeah, most of your life you're not making that mistake. So I always make this mistake. Except for most of my life when I'm not making that mistake. And are there times where I almost made that mistake and I did? Of course. So my mind is kind of habituated and it focuses on things. And if it's undisciplined, it will have these opportunities, what we call a default mode. Default mode is all about me, John. So if I'm not actively focused on what I'm doing, engaged consciously in what I'm doing, uh, my mind will mind wander. My mind will do things like ruminate, start thinking about what I could have where I would like to be, what I you know, really need to do. And I'm going to immediately have a lot of dissatisfaction. I'm actually going to have a lot of unhappiness because my mind in that rumination uh, is very me-centered and very much focused on uh, things I'd like to do or things that uh, I need to worry about or rumination. And we all know what that's feeling when we're caught up in rumination or angry with someone or resentful and, and it's just, you know, we don't have a lot of choice. So the wisdom of compassion has to always do with the ultimate source of our suffering, 
which is the event or the person I'm focused on. It's how I'm attending to that event, how I'm experiencing it, and what's the mind I'm bringing to it. What's the mind I'm bringing to this? Am I bringing a mind that says I shouldn't suffer? Am I bringing a mind that is part of an incredible human experience in a day that will never come again in my life? That's filled with challenges and joys and struggles. And when I look back at the events of my life that were difficult, well, didn't they get me here? If I am appreciating the character that I've developed in my life, I develop that character through hardship. You can't get character if I haven't given it to you, can you? My resiliency is built upon challenge. So everything you know, that we think about in terms of something that in my past was this tragedy or trauma can also be the source of your resiliency, your strength, character. And those events in the past can all be experiences that cultivate the wisdom of removing suffering in my life today. This is how we grow. And is there any event in your life that does not offer you the opportunity to be a better person, to improve the quality of your life? So someone might say, well, if I get fired, that's not going to offer me the opportunity <laughs> to improve my life. Or does it? Does it offer an opportunity to look for different types of occupations, find more resiliency and peace? Does it give you, if, you know, I think many of us have been uh, in relationships that ended. It was very sad, but it gave rise maybe to another relationship or a job that ended, which gave rise to another job. So if we start to understand this dynamic that there's a natural amount of mental and emotional suffering in life, but the vast majority of it that we experience personally isn't necessarily natural or necessary. It has to do more with how I'm relating to these experiences and the story of them telling around these experiences in an untrained mind that is constantly seeking to feel good and to avoid feeling bad and on a quest in an untrained way, in my case, maybe like a little teenager mind that's just looking for what's interesting next. And having some constructs in my mind about how the world should be, how others should be, how my life should be, rather than an embracing of how things are. And what am I paying attention to, right? Am I paying attention to the two things that aren't going right my way? Or am I paying attention to the thousand things that are? For example, I can walk, I can talk, I have food at home, I have water out of my own tap. Uh, you know, the list is long. I could read and write. I actually have resources to be able to uh, use technology today. I mean, when we think about all the things that have gone my way today, there's, there's a huge number. So what am I paying attention to? And what I pay attention to becomes the scope of my reality. Focusing on this one thing that this one person did that I didn't like. Or a myriad of other things I could be paying attention to, including uh, this person, or how I could grow from that situation, or the multitude of friends that I have, and the people who have helped me, and how I could be a benefit to others. What am I paying attention to? So what I'm paying attention to, how I'm attending to it, is creating an incredible potential of a lot of suffering in my life. And mixed up in that is our desire to be happy. So I do want to get to that. Let me see if I can. So the more we live in alignment with our values, the greater our sense of well-being and over, overall happiness will be. Second working at positive. So first one is we're just going to eliminate a lot of mental and emotional suffering simply by not making up a bunch of stories about how the world ought to be and how I would 
not confusing that with how I would like it to be. And, uh, and here, if I can get my little mouse to work again. <laughs> there we go. The search for happiness is one of the chief sources of unhappiness. So it's this desire to be happy that we chase things on our little hedonic treadmill here. And this journey to be happy is going to be the source of a lot of stress, worry, fear, anxiety in our lives, right? The very things that we want, that we desire for happiness, the house, job, car, relationship, the vacation, those things, uh, how we want our kids to go to school, and those types of things, uh, the things that we buy, right, the activities we engage in, those things are going to make us happy. And yet, if we look more deeply at the stress, worry, fear, and anxiety in our life, aren't they all directly related to the house, job, car, relationships, the things I want, fearing that I won't get them, fearing that I may lose them, fearing that they won't be the way I, I want them to be, is the belief that if they, things happen just a particular way, I'll be happy. So is any of that true? <laughs> yeah. How many things in your life have gone exactly the way you would like? How many happy moments have you had? Can't even count them. And yet, can I still be stressed, worried, caught up in fear today? Absolutely. How many times have things gone absolutely <laughs> the wrong way for us? can't count them. And yet we can still be pretty happy today. And so the simple truth is that the events themselves will come and go. And that moment of happiness of the good vacation or the promotion or whatever that is or getting that job, then we have to have that job, shifts. And then my mind goes to what else will make me happy? And what else will make me happy? And what else will make me happy? And I don't really recognize that none of those things are going to fill this sense of well-being and happiness that I'm really seeking because it can't come from an event. That's just a temporary pleasure. And yet my mind will chase it. And there's a lot of stress and suffering around that. Very simple, straightforward chart I just want to share. See how we do with the time here. Yep. Science of happiness, where's our happiness really come from? And so this green here, our set point. Well, that's our kind of baseline is you know, our homeostasis. You know, some people are a little happier than others on general. Some people are pretty bad, pessimistic, you know, grumpy, you know, grumpy people. Some people are really perky, most of us somewhere in between. And that's just kind of how we are. It's our set point. We might have some fun, laughter, and then we come back to our kind of set point might have some difficulty and we're kind of sad, then we come back to our set point. In other words, it's kind of our, our uh, homeostasis, where we kind of come back to. It's our level of well-being in general. 50% of that is really just our conditioning, you know, our, our genetics are involved, how much we are loved when we were kids or not, and some of the things that we've overcome. So this environment uh, is kind of our set point. Well, so if something good happens, you'll notice you can still be worried tomorrow, right? So this great thing happens, and now it's Tuesday. Now I got things to worry about. Something terrible happens, and then we come back. Now it's Tuesday. Now I'm looking forward to something else. If we look back at our life, you're going to have innumerable events of worry, fear, joy, sadness, tragedy, uh, happiness. And they've all come and gone, and I'm still here, and I'm here at my set point. None of those events had the lasting impact we thought they would, that we would finally have it made. So intentional activities, 40%, intentional activities means doing things you feel good about, doing things that are aligned with your values. Intentional, I'm doing these things because they have meaning and purpose in my life. That is 40% here, 40%. 
the circumstances, which is where we're all focused, is 10%. So it's not nothing. 10%, you know, house, job, car, relationship, thing, circumstances. Uh, I'm thinking about some ice cream I bought at the store earlier. I'm going to have that later. That's the circumstance. I'm going to have a temporary pleasure. I'll be all right. But it's not going to give me a sense of self-worth. So if we start to really put this dynamic into place, in our life, we want to understand that we actually have control over the single most determinant factor of happiness in our life. And it's not how things turn out, it's not our circumstances. It's how we show up for them. Am I doing, am I showing up for these experiences in my life in a way I'll feel good about? In alignment with my values. Virtue from Aristotle. Nothing new here. Grandma can teach us this. We just don't apply it because we really think the activity will make us happy rather than why we're engaging in the activity, how we're showing up in our house, not the house, how we're engaging with others at work, not the job, our intentional activities. And so the point here is that if I engage in intentional activities, which I have control over, I don't have control over job, house, relation, I don't have, you know, we're in a pandemic, I don't have much control over that, but I do have control over how I show up with my neighbors. I have control over the real sources of happiness in my life. The misperception is that if these other things turn out the way I want, I'll be happy. And we put our energy there. Well, the interesting piece now with, neuro, with our neuroscience and all that is that by engaging in intentional activities, I can change the level of my set point. So doing things that are meaningful, purposeful, that I feel good about will actually increase my level of well-being. My set point changes. When I come back on Tuesday, I'm feeling much more connected to part of life and uh, I'm much more resilient. I have a greater sense of well-being. My set point changes. So we can rewire our brains. We can rewire our experience. And so this is something we can do every day regardless of circumstances. So the wisdom of compassion means I don't want to suffer. So I don't want to put a lot of stress where in fear chasing happiness that doesn't exist, a source of happiness that doesn't exist. Imagine what that would be like if we lived in reality and understood the real source of my happiness and well-being. I think I have a question here. Let me see what pops up. So a comment uh, from Paula. It seems like gratitude maintained calm has a role with everything we're talking about. And yeah, well put, Paula. What I'm attending to and how I attend to something is going to have a huge experience, right? So, and if I maintain an attitude of gratitude, right? So cultivating a sense of gratitude and connection, well, that's a different way of attending to an event, right? My car gets hit, I can be grateful. I have a car, I can be grateful. I didn't get injured. You know, I can be grateful the other person didn't get injured. It's going to have a very different experience. Calm, now, both calm and gratitude are skills that we need to develop, and that's where we're going to ultimately go with the, uh, the skills of cultivating the wisdom of compassion. Because everything that I'm sharing with you right now, it might make a lot of sense to you. None of this will help you remove your suffering. <laughs> right. Laura mentioned it earlier in her talk. Uh, you can starve to death reading the cookbook. Knowing this information is not going to change your life. Realizing this will. And the way that we realize this is we need to treat these as working hypotheses in our lives. And start to notice, is it true? Is it true that I get caught up in really wanting this to happen, not wanting that to happen. Does it create stress when we're in fear? And then how long does that last? So I need to experience that consciously, that which means I need to be mindful. I need to be aware, be calm and present as my excitement, my anxiety arises 
and this event maybe be late to something and then be aware that uh, how I felt and then be aware that I survived and I'm okay. And now it's Tuesday. To notice the very transient nature of the stress, the anxiety, the exaggerated quality of having to be somewhere on time, the tension that it built up. And then to notice, I mean, how many times has that happened in your life? You can't even remember. But at the time, it was very strong. So in order to realize this, as opposed to know it, or study it, or talk about it, requires mindfulness. It requires training our minds so that we can be present in our lives to note the exaggerated qualities that we have about the things and events and people in our lives. So we can start living in reality rather than have our mind drag us around from every stress we and fear. And belief that, boy, if I had that, I'd be happy. We need to really drive this home. A dear friend of mine who took a course with me once who's uh, got paraly you know, some paralysis in her body, has had a lot of chronic pain, has had some, some real pain in her life, and her body doesn't function you know, very well. She needs special accommodation to drive a car and things. Uh, she shares with me, you know, I just, because uh, she's going through a real difficult time. She had some flare-ups. She was in a lot of pain. And, and she shared with me that the thought came to her mind, boy, if I was healthy, I could be happy. And she goes, boy, that's so not true. I mean, she shared this with me. I put, and if anyone that I know, I mean, this is someone you would think, wow, how, imagine what her life would be and how much happier she could be if, if she was healthy. Seems reasonable, right? Except for one thing. How many of you are healthy? Could you also be miserable, upset, have anxiety, fear, worry? She looked around and she saw there's a lot of healthy people who are not nearly as happy as she is. And she caught that. So again, there is normal pain and normal mental and emotional suffering part of the human experience. Understanding that, I don't need to exaggerate it and add another 200% suffering, right? I can feel the pain or the anxiety and allow that to come and go observe uh, that, you know, this is how I'd like something to be, you know, but what's really going to matter is showing up in a way I feel good about. And so now can I observe myself showing up in life in alignment with my values, in a way I feel good about, and does my quality of well-being, my self-worth, increase? Because fundamentally, the relationship that's going to matter the most to all of us is the one we have with ourselves. If my mind is telling me I'm not worthy, I'm not enough, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. I'm not going to find that peace of well-being. But if I can develop a good relationship with myself, with my inner voice, and not have a critic, this was talked about with both Laura and Mary Mike, but to have my mindfulness be a supportive friend who's there to support me to grow and learn that I make mistakes just like everybody else. And uh, but I'm valuable just like everybody else. I'm not the center of the universe. I'm a valuable part of it. That's what we want to develop. And we can develop that voice by being aware of the thoughts that we encourage in our life. And we get worthiness and value by doing worthy and valuable things. We, uh, you know, my big quote there is, doing things that make us feel good it's not the source of our happiness. Doing things we feel good about is. Not doing things that make me feel good, but doing things I feel good about. And I can do things I feel good about that make me feel good. They're, they're not, they don't need to be in conflict. So I got this great question here. Christina, thank you so much. What is 
the one thing that you would love to see each of us do to reduce suffering in the world around us. And a uh, very simple one is recognize the value in others. Recognize the value in others. And, and that does not mean that we co-sign behaviors or attitudes that are, are harmful. It means we recognize that they're just like me, doing the best they can with what they have. That I am a valuable being, they're a valuable being. And there's this, uh, this verse that I'll leave you with, is just like me, all others want to be happy, just like me, all others are trying to avoid happiness just like me all others have known hardship sadness and despair just like me all others are trying to get their needs met and just like me all others are learning how to live i don't believe i've ever met another human being that wants to be a bad human being. I think every human being I've ever met in my life wants to be a good human being. Now, I don't have scientific data for that. I haven't met every human being. But I do come from a field of recovery and I am in recovery and I've done many harmful things in my life and I changed my life 36 years ago. And, uh, and I work you know, with people and have dear friends who grew up in the penitentiaries. And not a single one of them ever wanted to be anything but a good person. But a lot of them, like me, didn't know how just yet. We are a product of our environments. And whether we were loved or whether we were beaten as kids, whether we had adverse child experiences, whether we had loving experiences, all of that has shaped our experience. And so that other person who seems entirely different from us, we have no idea what they've lived through. And, but we do know that what they're sharing and the way they're living makes sense to them from their experience. So the most important thing to do is to recognize the value in others and treat them as valuable. If I start to understand and others have such value. I can attend to them in a very different way. That's how we change the world. Nobody's going to agree with my viewpoint when I call them an idiot or tell them that they're, you know, whatever. But if I attend to them and hear what they have to say and then share from a way that uh, honors our shared value, we have an incredible opportunity to transform our communities, our experiences. Just like me, all others are seeking happiness. Everybody's trying to do that. And I've done some pretty terrible things to be happy. I've also done some great things. I'm not any one thing I've done. Right? Those are things I've done. And I've done a lot of good things. I've done some harmful things. I've done some stupid things. I've done humiliating things. I've done incredibly kind and, and wonderful things. Those are all experiences that I've had, but at any given moment in my life, and Laura brought this up earlier, I never intentionally tried to screw up my life. At any given moment in my life, I did the best I could at that moment. That's what I had at that moment. Today, I have a few more tools. I didn't then. Everyone else is living their experience through their own lens of their upbringing and traumas and what they've been exposed to and how they've seen the world, the culture they're raised in. You know, what we live in in this world is a very subjective place where I see it very differently than the person next to me. I don't know how many people are watching this right now, but everyone's hearing something a bit different. And everyone listening now has some different life experiences and views. I'm not right. Everyone has a valid experience from their perspective. So the single most important thing to do is to see the value in others. And then if we can take it a step further, let's greet them as though they're valuable. One of my favorite activities is to try to greet everyone as though they're an old dear friend. You know, you see somebody say, hey, how you doing? Hey, grocery store, how you doing? You know, eye contact, attention. 
to greet people as though they're valuable. So here's a question. I'm glad this came up. How do you balance having compassion and recognizing the value in others while still maintaining healthy boundaries without enabling inappropriate or abusive behavior? And you actually answered the question. The most compassionate thing I can do and attend to value to others is to have healthy boundaries and not enable inappropriate and abusive behavior. That's actually the answer to the question. A lot of people confuse compassion with enabling. There's nothing compassionate about that. That does not reduce suffering. It increases it, right? So compassion acts to remove suffering. So appropriate boundaries are incredibly compassionate for yourself and for those you're applying them to. Compassion does not mean you're a doormat. There's nothing compassionate about that. See the value in others is separating their actions from their value as a human being, but we deal with the actions. So out of compassion, I can hold people accountable. I can attend to their actions, which are inappropriate, but I can still recognize that they're a valuable human being trying to find their way and I owe it to them to be healthy in my boundaries so that we can both have an opportunity to grow. Compassion is about removing suffering. Anything that increases suffering, not compassion. So the skillfulness of compassion is to apply biggest question is what's the healthiest thing to do in this situation that's going to remove suffering long term so I'm so glad you brought that up because uh, a lot of people confuse loving kindness and compassion with things like being a doormat or enabling unhealthy behavior it's nothing loving kind about that there's nothing compassionate about that Asking a bigger question, which is what's the healthiest thing to do in this situation for them? That's going to have a better answer. Okay, we are already up in an hour. Can you imagine that? Uh, anyone with a last minute question or anything going to pop up here? Uh, I will. Oops, let me see if I can get. If you would like any further resources, uh, boy, that sure didn't come up, you can visit my website, which is ameanfullife.us, and uh, you'll find a lot of uh, different types of resources, activities that can help us in this process of being more mindful and being able to act much more out of compassion, loving kindness, remove a lot of suffering in our lives. And with that, I do want to thank all of you for your, all of your kindness and support, the compassion you already bring to the world. I'd like to encourage you to enjoy the rest of these films, to be inspired by compassion and action. Uh, and thank you so much for your support. Uh, we want to grow this Compassion Institute, this uh, from the way of compassion into a wide range of outreach to grow and nourish compassion in the world. And so you're a big part of that. Thank you so much for participating and for all of your support here. So with that, I bid you all well. And again, thank you so much for all the good you're already bringing to the world. <laughs>